is a professional brand. They start selling at CVS, and I'm super geeked about. And so I went in and I got a brown palette that's actually for your eyebrows, but I use it for eyelashes. Yeah. Not eyelashes, eyeshadow. Yeah. Because it's really light and you can't really tell it looks really natural. So, and I got new foundation that had buy one get one half off, so I got two okay, so and like powder. I want to like get like fifty bucks and just go to the grocery store. And I spent sixty two bucks. Oh my god, that's so much. But hey, I, I feel like this looks a lot better. I got BB cream and I actually kind of hate it. Yeah, totally worth it. Like totally worth it. I was I was using it. I noticed uh, it's it's really oily and not supposed to use powder, but if I don't use powder, I'm super oily in the BB cream. Yeah. So I was using powder and the powder was collecting all the BB cream. It looked like some like sponges are on my face. No. And so I was like, no, this is not working. No, so I went back to my. I use Redmond for the most part. So I use I Neutrogena for Maybelline. I use Maybelline. Maybelline for. Uh, mascara brush so it doesn't look as pasty. Yeah. And my eyelash filler is really great. It's a, like a low easy affordable one. I use I honestly don't use lotion because my eyelashes are so greasy. Yeah. Like I'm going to pull my eyebrows out. Yeah. But I wanna go and I wanna get Jeffree Star or Jeffree Star Beauty Beauty Star The Patrick Star? No. Jeffree Star. Okay, so I have two new people that do the product. I know I know Patrick. Patrick Shino Star. Danny Mua. Patrick Star. He's Patrick's best friend. Patrick see Star is my fave. Let like me see if I can. He's just like, what do I do? All right, here's Manny Mua. He's Patrick's best friend. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have makeup on right now. So good. There's Patrick. I know. Oh my gosh, so sad. Sad. He has this gray wig that I love that he did. But it's so mad because I'm like, I have, I have Snapchat for literally two minutes. And I didn't even. Wasn't he the guy who was like, made the exclusive thing on your story? Yeah. I didn't even, I can't even think of anything else. I was so angry. I was like,
this morning. And this would be a good time for y'all to <laughs> greet one another, huh? Y'all. So go say howdy. <laughs> getting ready to do something that the Lord has commanded us to do and if the the kids want to come up here and stand on the platform Richard you come down here and join me okay yep we're here in worship we're here in worship yeah thank you this is an exciting time in the church And even the message that I'm going to share with you this morning speaks to this very thing that the Lord has has told us as folks come into relationship with Him that we are to, to baptize them. And this morning, Richard comes to make that decision. Richard, have you come to that point where you have asked Jesus Christ to come into your life to be your Savior, not just to save you and rescue you, but to also be your Lord? Have you done that? his testimony. He has
while they're finishing up there, we're going to go ahead and do our praise reports. Does anybody have a praise from this week? Anyone? Anyone? You're going once, going twice? I've got one, Russ. Okay. I know that uh, Sham has often uh, said, I give thanks for the, for the knots, for the things that haven't happened. You guys well know I, I'm the proud owner of a 79 Volkswagen that has given me nothing but trouble since the day I bought it. And I recently had it in the shop for, I don't know, two months. And uh, But one of the things that the uh, mechanic said to me was, you know, when I got that thing up in the air, he said, your tires are bad. He says, I wouldn't drive another mile on those things. <laughs> and so, and I've been driving a lot of miles on those things. So for us, it's a thanks for the knots. And you, you wonder, my word, why so many problems with this thing? Because I don't want you on the road. Because you got some bad tires. And I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for the knots. Mm -hmm. Amen. I know uh, Cody and Bethany had that experience in her car the other day. The uh, tire blew, but it was to the point where the cords were coming out of the out of the rubber. And thankfully, they did not have an accident when it did blow. Naomi had a knots also. Naomi. I haven't been tripping ever since I, I haven't been wearing my walking aid, and I haven't been tripping ever since. Amen. She'll wear, she will wear her walk aid again. It, I just made a mistake of not realizing that she, uh, that the new electrodes were not working properly and chemically burned her, not, I mean, burned her skin. So that's healing. So the whole time while that's healing, she couldn't wear it. But we were very concerned that she would have falls through that time frame. And it hasn't. Amen. Any other praises? I couldn't find my checkbook anywhere. I couldn't find my checkbook anywhere. And I was looking and I, I cleaned the whole house, tried to find it. And for some reason, I put it in my file cabinet, in my file <laughs> thing. And I'm grateful because if somebody got a hold of it, I might not have had any money in my checking account. My rent check might have bounced. Yeah. So that's good. So that's good. Amen. I'm not going to get through this, but anyway, at work, um, over the past probably uh, seven, eight years, we've had several of the... Um, Young Phelps kids work with us. And we've had um, Timothy and Zacharias and Joseph and um, I can't think of the other one. But anyway, um, very good workers. And they had left their compound and, and um, with nothing. They had nothing. They weren't allowed to go back in. They weren't allowed to associate with them. And uh, two weeks ago and Zacharias was one of them that worked for us and he got his degree um, in Washburn in nursing and went to work for Grace Hospice and he called me last week a couple weeks ago and he said he wanted to know if he could come back and work um, with us and, and I said well Zach what's going on and he said that a couple weeks ago a couple months ago that he was the kid that jumped off the bridge in North Topeka trying to kill himself. And he uh, had broke his femur, his hip, and, and he was recovering from that and he could not go back to work where he was. And, and I told him, you're just more than welcome to come back. Just let me know when you want to. And but he has struggled so much. Um, he spent his life savings of $8,000 making signs that said, love is greater, love is better. Stood out at 21st and Wanamaker, giving back gifts to the community for free. Um, 
that he still believes there is a God, but he doesn't know him. So just pray for him, and if he does come to back to work, that I can minister to him and show him God's love. Uh, we had our first sonogram on the first. The baby is healthy. We're not going to say the sex yet. We're going to save that for the family today. Um, but everything's good, and we just want to give praise for that. I know something you guys don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I have one. I have one. That? Sorry. Oh. Um, I just want to praise God for financial coverage. Mm-hmm. Yep, that's it. Amen. Uh, when the heard about the tornadoes down in Georgia last week, I was. Uh, came home from work and I flipped the TV on and I saw the weather channel they were talking about storms down there and they said that there was a storm near Fort Stewart, Georgia. Well that's where my son Daniel's stationed and I thought you know, I'll uh, I'll give it a little bit and I'll give him a call see what's going on. Well he texted me and he said Dad, he said I was born and raised in Kansas lived there for 26 years and never saw a tornado and just a few minutes ago we were lowering the flag and we were doing the ceremony at the on the base there and he said this tornado came by and it was a hundred yards away from me. <laughs> he said he said I'd never seen one before. It's pretty spectacular. <laughs> but anyways, I was just giving thanks that he was okay and everyone else around there was good. It's just kind of a kind of an interesting interesting story and I've got a picture of that on my cell phone. I'll show anybody if they're interested. So <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, let's pray. Dear Lord, I just thank you, God, that uh, you are just an awesome, awe-inspiring God, Lord, that uh, I revere. And your your word says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And God, that's not fear as being scared of you, but that's fear as, have, fear as having reverence and a holy awe. And God, I just thank you that you are Lord of everything. You're Lord of the mountains and you're the Lord of the valleys. And God, I thank you for your protecting hand over the praises that were voiced here where either a tire blew or uh, there was a close call. And with Daniel and the tornado that it was instead of a hundred yards away, God, I think that it was a hundred yards away and not right on their base. And I just pray, God, now, Holy Spirit, that you'll just continue to be here. Um, and as we lift up the name of Jesus, I just pray, God, that you'll just be in our midst and that we can just glory in your presence. In Jesus' name. Let's stand and continue to worship.
my world may fall, I'll never let you go.
It's good to see you this morning, and um, I want to share a message with you this morning that um, God laid on my heart. Uh, I'm just about eight weeks short of being 26 years ago. First time I ever preached this message, and I want to tell you why I'm preaching it to you again, because I was engaged in my first interim pastor position at that point. God laid a message on my heart. Some of you were in that church when I first preached that message. Some of you have heard it since as I've been your interim in another church. But what happened is I shared that message and when the message was done and we had dismissed and we were milling around like we do in church, greeting and loving on each other and supporting one another. An elderly man walked up to me with tears literally streaming down his cheeks. And I will never forget the words that he said and then what God said to me immediately following. Here's a guy, and he looked at me, and he said, Where were you 40 years ago when I started pastoring churches? And I thought, In my mama's womb? <laughs> because at that point I probably was, or if not, I had just been born. <laughs> and he said, I have pastored churches for 40 years, and I have never heard that before and I would have given anything to have heard that while I was pastoring God's church and God said don't ever take it for granted that the people of God know why they exist so I want to share with you this morning about the purpose of His church, this your local church, this our fellowship of believers, and why we gather and why we go out and why we are who we are. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, a verse or verses that you have uh, memorized probably. Matter of fact, the first thing I do when I become an interim, I ask for a copy of Constitution and Bylaws to make sure that I lead you in a way that is legal <laughs> because this is a document that uh, by our standards, this is how we operate. And I always, one of the first things I go looking for is what is their purpose statement? I like your purpose statement. Uh, it seems like it starts exactly where my message starts today. But having that and doing it could be two different things. It could. Let's look at what Jesus said first, and you have written in your Constitution bylaws as the purpose why you exist as a church. Because Jesus said in Matthew chapter 28, Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. He had told them prior to his crucifixion, he says, Listen, after I am raised from the dead, I'm going to meet you at this location. And they somehow remembered that. <laughs> and so they journeyed there. When they realized he had risen from the dead, they went to the place that he had told them to go. And I love this. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Listen, folks, it's okay to have doubts creep into your mind. Just don't let the doubts build a nest. Don't let them make a home. Deal with them. God can handle your doubts. <laughs> it won't freak him out. <laughs> he, 
He knows more than you anyway. And he says, let me tell you how to get through that. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Every time I do an interim, this is one sermon I preach there because I think it's so vitally important because these are the words that Jesus gave us. And it is so easy to have them here but not have them here and here and here and here in our whole being as we go. You know, when the, when the world looks at the church, most of them ignore us. There's a whole lot of folks that got up this morning in Topeka and church had never even crossed their mind. Matter of fact, I, I loved once I was doing a mission project in a community that I will not name, nor will I name the church that I was doing that mission project with. And um, what I did on that particular day was I stood out under the marquee of the church, busy street. It was kind of in, in, in an urban area. And uh, this was the church that covered uh, almost a, a square block big church and I stood under the marquee and as people walked by I would stop and say excuse me uh, I am new to this city and I am looking for blank Baptist church can you tell me where I can find it yeah yeah I've, I've heard I've heard of that church uh, I, I think if you were to go down a couple of blocks and over you'd probably find it over there and other people would say nope Never heard of it. Don't know where it is. Now, I'm standing under the marquee that says blank Baptist Church. <laughs> they pretty well ignored that church. Others tolerate it. God called me to serve on the staff of that church. And I remember one day I walked across the street and knocked on the door of the house, literally walked out the front door of the church, directly across the street, knocked on the door of that church, and when the man answered the door, I said, Hi, I'm Terry McElvain, and I serve on this church staff, and I came over to meet you because you are our neighbor and to invite you to, to come and to worship with us. And he said, Finally! And I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> but I knew the trouble didn't reside just in me, but the trouble was for the her ch whole church. Because he immediately said to me, you are the first person that's ever knocked on my door from that church other than the ones who have come to say, can we buy your house because we would like to tear it down. We need more parking. Those were his words. He was tolerating the church. And you know as well as I do in this day and age, a lot of folks are opposed to the church. Most persecuted faith in the United States right now is Christianity. Those, I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about those who have the relationship. And guess what, folks? It's going to get worse before it gets better. I've read the book. Quit belly aching about it and do something to share the good news because there are hard days coming and some folks are going to need to know about what's going on. The good news is God established the church, Jesus founded it, and the Holy Spirit empowers it. So we have good company to stand on. But you need to know who you are and where you're going in this life as a church. And the church is made up of individuals. It's not the brick and mortar and all the other stuff that makes up the building. The church are people like Richard who have come to that point where they've accepted Christ into their life. 
The story is told about Billy Graham. In the year 2000, the, the people of his hometown there in North Carolina wanted to honor Billy, and they asked him to come to this special appreciation dinner that they were having for him. And he, if you know anything about Billy Graham, he does not like to be honored or anything like that. And he said, no, I just can't come. And he said, I, 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 oh, no. And they said, please, 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 you are so well known in our community. We just want to say thank you. Thanks. You don't have to say a speech or anything like that unless you want to, but just come. And they finally talked him into it, and he went. And, of course, after the dinner, they recognized him and praised him. And you guessed it. They looked at, would you like to say a few words? And, and so Billy Graham did stand up, and he shared a few words. And he said, uh, I want you to look at the suit I'm wearing. And he said, um, I, I just bought this suit for... Uh, for this particular engagement because my, my, my children and my grandchildren kind of been on my case recently because I'm kind of becoming in my old age kind of slovenly and I need to freshen it up. <laughs> and so I've, I've, I've bought the suit for this, but I've also bought it for another reason. The next time you see me in this suit, I'll be laying in a casket. I'll be laying in a casket because this is the suit I'm going to be buried in. And he said, it reminds me of a story. He said, uh, in the early days of travel on the train, Einstein, Albert Einstein, got on the train. And uh, some of you may have remembered days like this, and some of you have read stories about things like this. But usually when you get on the train, the conductor would come down the aisle, and he would ask for your ticket that you had purchased, and they'd punch it to show that you had paid for it and you were on the train. And as the conductor was coming down the aisle, he came up to Albert Einstein and he said, a ticket, please. And he reached into his vest pocket to pull out his ticket. And it wasn't there. And so he reached into his pants pocket and it wasn't there. And he reached into his coat pocket and it wasn't there. And he opened his briefcase and it wasn't there. And all of a sudden, the conductor was very embarrassed because he knew Albert Einstein. And he said, it's, it's, it's okay, Dr. Einstein. He said, I know who you are. I know you wouldn't get on this train without a ticket. Just, just relax. Don't worry about it. And so the conductor walked on down the aisle. When he got to the back of the train to open the go door to go to the next car, he happened to turn around and looked. And Einstein was on his hands and knees underneath, looking underneath the chair where he had been seated. And the conductor came running back up and he said, Please, Dr. Einstein, don't worry about your ticket. I know you bought a ticket. I know it's okay. And he said, I know who you are. And Einstein stood up and he said, and I know who I am as well. But I don't know where I'm going, but that ticket tells me where I'm going. <laughs> and folks, you know who you are. But do you really know where you're going as a church? Do you know where you're going as an individual? And that's what Jesus was talking about. I'm going to tell you things today that you know probably everything already I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> but I want to remind you because, again, it may not be any deeper than here. So let's look at it. <clears throat> because in this passage of Scripture, Jesus gives us who the authority of the church is. He tells us the assignment of the church. And he gives the church assurance for us to accomplish our assignment. So as we go on down there, beginning in verse 18, Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus is the authority of the church. As your interim pastor, I am not the authority of this church. Your previous pastors have not been the authority of the church. And whomever you call to be your next pastor will not be the authority of the church. Jesus is the head of the church, as it tells us over in the epistles uh, later on in the New Testament. And he says... As the head of the church, I have the authority. And so we operate under His authority. 
I remember as a boy growing up, when Dad told me to do something, he said, I'm telling you, go do this. And I would go to a store and I would say, my dad has sent me and I need to get this and take it back to him. Okay. You know, and it was done. Because I went under the authority of my dad's name. I didn't go as a nine-year-old boy going down and say, I want you to give me that. Go back to Matthew, Matthew 16. Matthew chapter 16. And you know the, the setup in this, because I need to set this in context. It's like I set up the other passage of Scripture. After the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus said this to them. Well, this is happening in his ministry time. And uh, in chapter 16 of Matthew, uh, verse 13, you know where he came into the, the, the city, the district of Caesarea Philippi, and, and he was asking them, who do people say that I am? And they give all of these answers. But then if you look at verse 18, uh, uh, excuse me, if you look at verse 15, Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock, on this statement of faith that you have just made, that I am the Son of God, he said, On that rock I will build my church. Jesus said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Do you see his authority? And he gave it to those who believed in him and said, I am the authority and you operate in my authority. That ought to be good news to you. You don't have to be powerful. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be a genius. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be anything other than a child of God operating under his authority, just like a nine-year-old boy listened to his dad. Dad said, go get it. I went and got it, and the people responded to me because I was going under the authority of my earthly dad. Now we go under the authority of our Heavenly Father. And we do the assignment that he has told us to do. And, and people are going to be honest with you. When we talk about doing the assignment, I hear it day in and day out. But I'm afraid. I'm, I'm scared. I don't know how. Uh, uh, that, that, that's, that's for guys that are like you that are been called to the ministry. No. No. Matter of fact, these guys he was talking to later on, they were brought in and people said, man, these guys are just nobodies and they don't have the education and yet they speak with a power. We can't get over it. These are, as the scripture says, uneducated people. But they walked under his authority. So, as we go in his authority, what is our assignment? Go back to Matthew chapter 28, and our assignment is threefold. He says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. That is our assignment. First of all, our assignment is to make disciples. The emphasis in this passage, if you look at it in the Greek, it is not on going. It is on sharing the gospel with people so that the Father can save them and they can become disciples. You will never save anybody. Praise God. Because <laughs> if I were to save you, you would be in a heap of trouble. A whole lot of trouble. He will save them. And as we're going, we need to share the gospel with people. Wendell Ballou, who preached this same passage of Scripture, I'm sure he preached quite a bit different message, a whole lot better than anything that I can do, but Wendell Ballou, good friend of Peck Lindsay, a lot of you all know Peck Lindsay, and Peck 
heard him telling this story once about Wendell Ballou that he was preaching in the hill country of Kentucky, in hillbilly country. That's what they called themselves, hillbillies. And so uh, Wendell Ballou was preaching this revival in this church back in the hills, and the next day after he preached on this passage of Scripture, uh, they went to visit a man who had been in church that night, the previous night. And so we, they went and they knocked on his door and he said, um, do, you, do you know me? And he said, yeah, you're that preacher guy down that church. And uh, yeah, I was there last night. And he said, uh, so you, you heard what I preached about last night. And he said, yeah, I did. And he said, so tell me, what did I say? And he kind of stroked his old scraggly beard and he said, well, he said, uh, if I understand it right, you said sin is how I'm going anyway. I ought to tell somebody about Jesus while I'm going. And Wendell Ballou, in his own words, said, that's the best translation of that passage of Scripture that I've ever heard in my life. Seeing as how you're going anyway, tell somebody about Jesus. But how many of us go and go and go and go and Jesus never even crosses our mind, much less comes out of our lips? And the doors open all the time. I recently sat with a man, and uh, sorry, Jay, uh, he's an insurance agent, but I'm, it's not you, okay? I was with another insurance agent, and he began to tell me how his mother had just died. Can you scream, open door, open door? And I just began to minister to him as best I know how, not from a minister standpoint, but from a guy whose own mother had just died a few years ago. And I said, I, I, I understand how you feel because I've been there. And I began to talk with him. And I said, what got me through was the relationship I have with Jesus Christ. And he smiled and he said, me too. I didn't know he was a believer until that point. And we've talked several times since then and he's of another flavor of ch Christian church, but uh, he's still born again. He's still born again. Seeing as how you're going anyway, tell somebody about Jesus. That, folks, is your assignment. And, and, and if, if, if I'm a school teacher and you are my students, what do I expect you to do when I give you an assignment? Boy, that was complex. Would you say it again? Because that was really complex, your answer. Do it. Now, that doesn't mean you walk up to everybody on the street. Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you... No. You look for him to open the door. But, folks, what's happening to most of us is God opens the door. Sometimes he put bells and lights on it, and we go, um, Boy, I better back out of this because... I don't know how to do that. Well, if you don't know how to do it, learn. I'll teach you. All you got to do is tell your story. When I was nine years old, I got saved. The next day after I got saved on a Sunday, the next day I went to school. The next day after school, I went and found my best buddy, David. And I said, David, you won't believe what happened to me yesterday. And he said, What? And one nine-year-old boy told an eight-year-old boy, and he said, man, that's interesting. He said, I've been thinking a lot about that lady lately, and he wasn't going to church. He didn't go to any church. And um, as best I could as a nine-year-old boy, I shared Christ with an eight-year-old boy, and as best as he could understand, he prayed to receive Christ that day, Monday afternoon, right after school, leaning right up against his trailer house. <laughs> yeah. I've since learned I'm supposed to be scared to do that. I didn't know any better then because I was overflowing with the joy that Jesus had put in my heart that I no longer was lost, but I was saved. I knew that I had a relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son, and it has changed my life. Now listen, I have backed out of places of opportunity, and, I, it, and I've come to recognize it, and I've asked God, never let me forget that sick feeling when I walked away when he opened a door and I didn't share. And I have been there, trust me, scared.
of what? Makes no difference. I was scared. Our assignment is to make disciples. Share with them Christ. Our second part of our assignment is to baptize them. We've just illustrated that today in baptism. And you'll notice there, the word baptized, um, baptism in the New Testament, there's only one Greek word that is ever used for baptism. And its meaning is to dip. It was an old blacksmith term. And the blacksmith, uh, fast forward all the way to the 1800s here. We're in Kansas and there's horses. And the blacksmith takes a, a piece of iron and he puts it in the fire and he gets it red hot. And when he gets it red hot, he brings it out, puts it on the anvil, and he beats it until it's in the shape of a, a horseshoe. Does he take that red hot horseshoe and nail it onto the horse's hoof? He'll only try that once, I guarantee you. <laughs> The horse will take care of his business real fast. What's he do with that horseshoe before he puts it on the hoof of the horse? He dips it under the water. And then he brings it out. That's the only meaning of the Greek word that is used every time in the New Testament for baptism. That's why we dip. But we dip, notice, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit... But did you see what it said there? Make disciples, baptizing them in the names of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Is that what it says? What's it say? Name. Name. The Godhead three in one. Jesus makes it very, very clear. I am and I will be what I will be. Remember that? Moses God was there, Jesus came, and now the Holy Spirit. I am what I am, I will be what I will be. It's just living truth of what he said back in Exodus, and it continues to unfold through the New Testament and even to this day. So we go, we make disciples, and then we baptize them in obedience. The obedience is a, a symbolic of, I have died to my old way of life and God has raised me to a new way of life. And the third part of the assignment is that we then teach them to make sure they understand everything in the Scripture. Is that what it says? That's not what it says. What's it say? They teach them to obey. Listen, when you get to heaven, God's not going to evaluate you because you were able to fill in every blank on the sheet of paper. Praise God, hallelujah, I'm not going to have that kind of test. But folks, believers, we will be judged. That just surprised some of you. <laughs> in order for Him to hand out our rewards to us that we have earned. Listen, all our sin is forgiven in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ once we come to know Him as our personal Savior. We will not be judged for our sins because Jesus has removed them as far as the east is from the west. No condemnation there. But what you get to celebrate and lay back down at the feet of Christ and use while you're in the glories of heaven will be because of your obedience to Him. And you say, well, I, that's, that's not right that I ought to do things in order to get a reward. Now, if you really understand it, you don't do them to get a reward, but when you do them because you've fallen madly in love with Jesus Christ, you get them anyway. Teach them to obey. Teach them to make this their lifestyle. We're not talking too much having doctrine in our head as we are having the lifestyle of obedience what we think, what we see, what we say, what we handle, where we go. It affects us. And it is a growth process. <laughs> Teach them to obey. You know, praise God, I, uh, I was not this size, even though I'm not real big. It, my mother is real glad I wasn't this big when I got born. Do I hear an amen from all the mothers out there? Yeah. I was born a little bitty baby. But I've grown to this size. 
But that took a while. It didn't happen overnight. Teaching them to obey. It's a non-stop process. And I will be learning till the day I die. And then I'll get to glory. And then I'm going to really learn. Because the veil will be cleared up. And I won't see through an opaque glass anymore. But I will see clearly. And then I'm really going to learn. Listen, one of the most exciting pilgrimages is that we get to continue to learn all the way through. And I'm going to remind you of things you already know, but there is so much I'm never going to remind you of or even teach you to begin with because there's so much more there that you can't believe. Thank you, Doyle, for a Bible study this morning. Rich. Rich. Where we just read the Scripture. Folks, here's an invitation. Get in Bible study. You know, I don't want to go there. I've heard all that stuff before. Well, then say, I volunteer to teach. <laughs> well, we don't have a class for you. Then go make your own class and go out there and bring folks in and say, I will be empowered by God and I will let Him help me find a class. Novel thinking here. Go build a class. Doyle, would it upset you next week if everybody showed up in your class and said, Doyle, this is the last day I'm going to sit in your class because starting next week on February 21st, I'm going to spend between 14 and 21 going out and finding me three or four folks I'm going to bring together and I'm going to teach them more to God as best I know how. Would that bother you? So get busy finding you some more because they're getting ready to vacate your class, boy, and you're not going to have class anymore. <laughs> Go, make disciples, baptize them, and then teach them. And here's the best part of the message. The assurance that he gives us. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You will never do the assignment alone. He will always be with you. Go back to Isaiah. Isaiah. Chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I know it's not Christmas time. And that's the only time we look at Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. But we're going to look at it today. We're just getting an early start on Christmas. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel means God with us. Remember, a name indicates the character of the person. And, and the father said, I will send a son. I will send my son part of the Godhead to you and he will be with you. Prophesied there. Go over to John. John chapter 1. Fast forward a few hundred years. In John, St. John chapter 1 verse 14 again. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What Isaiah prophesies, John reports, He came, and in the Greek it means He literally pitched His tent among us. He became one of us. He put on flesh and blood, never left His heavenly divinity. He was always the Son of God, but in human form. And he said, I'm going to live with them to show them who I am and their need for me and how to live from that point forward. Fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry. We've just read it. He said, Behold, I will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And Paul at that time, who was called Saul, and that probably really irritated him when he started meeting some of those believers and they started telling him about this Jesus. Matter of fact, he tried to kill them all and tried to stamp out the church. And so God went down and 
tapped him on the shoulder and said, Boo! <laughs> i got you, and you're going to serve me. And look what he writes over in Romans chapter 8. Paul now has been walking with God for a while. <laughs> and he has been, by the fact he was discipled, he was taught by the disciples. And look what he wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 38. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I will be with you always. So it's here. You've heard it again. But my question is, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? If you're here today and you're saying, man, <laughs> I am not a believer. I, 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 have, I don't have any relationship with Him. But I would like to have a relationship with Him. Today would be a great day. And I would love to personally share with you how you can have a relationship with Him. There are people seated around you that can share with you how they have a relationship with Him. And I would encourage you to come talk to me, talk with somebody you know in this room, and say, how can I know that I know Jesus Christ? Just like David and I did beside that trailer a long, long time ago. But let me speak now to
you sent your son to make it possible for us to have a relationship with you if there's anybody here that doesn't have that relationship father may they talk with me or somebody today seated around them and settle the issue because someday they're going to breathe their last and they're going, they are going to stand before you and father for those of us who know you father you've brought names and faces to the forefront of our minds and our hearts. Some of them are right here as our neighbors. We work with them. Um, some of them uh, live in this city. Some live outside this city, and they live maybe in another state or another country. Praise God, we live in a day where we can make contact with them. And we're not limited on sharing the gospel with anybody anywhere. And Father, may we take your assignment seriously. May we not come to this place next Sunday to worship you without having at least invited somebody to come ride with us or to come meet us here, to invite them to be part of 